fastest growing neurological conditions in the world, affecting about 6 million people globally, Parkinson's disease is one of the most common brain diseases, second to Alzheimer's. Parkinson is a motor disorder. It's a neurodegenerative disease, which means there is areas in the brain which degenerate. This degeneration starts with the loss of nerve cells. These cells release a chemical called dopamine that coordinates movement. But when there's so many of these cells dying off, people with Parkinson's aren't left with enough dopamine in their brain to control movement properly. The drop in this chemical is responsible for many of the symptoms of Parkinson's and there's over 40 of them. Some problem with walking, with stiffness, could be other things, could be problem with sleep, cognitive disability sometimes, well depend in what stage of the disease of course. Some will lose their smell, some will have some stomach uh, issues before, so there's, there's actually a big range of uh, issues but the core one is motor symptoms. Parkinson's symptoms have always been easy to detect, but that's not what Professor Meza is trying to do here. At the Hebrew University's Edmund and Lily Safra Centre for Brain Sciences, he's trying to detect and monitor Parkinson's using a different method called quantitative MRI. MRI is a wonderful tool to look inside the brain without opening it, and that's why we all love it and use it. We try to measure changes in the microstructure, so very small changes, very tiny things that we cannot see in our eye but they will change the signal in the MRI. And when we use that, we detect the small changes that occur in the tissue, in the cells. And that's what we are looking at in our method. What's unchanged in Professor Meza's method is the MRI machine used. What's different is what's being done with the information after the MRI. We develop an algorithm, so it's a software, if you want. We take those images, we look on the values in those images and make the, give them a quantitative interpretation, a physical interpretation. The algorithm run on MRI images is written by student Elior Drury from Professor Meza's lab. The tool he's developed separates the region they're interested in and calculates the values within each position. It becomes a bit of a mathematical matrix. Here we're looking at a brain image of MRI and these areas here, the blue area and the, and the red area are, are deep brain structures called the striatum uh, where changes occur in Parkinson's disease and what we developed is a method that I take this region and using this method I sample the values of the image along the uh, axis of this region and then we can detect small changes in Parkinson's disease. But when MRI is so often used in clinics, what makes the current method of MRI so different to the method developed by Professor Meza? The current method called first qualitative MRI, we creating, we're looking on images in this method. And this is macrostructure. We see in current changes, big changes in the tissue. In the method we develop, we call it microstructure. We're looking on these changes in the tissue uh, that allow to detect really changes in the cellular level. So it's the same method, the same MRI, but in one we look on, on the current method, we look on macro scale, and in our method we look on micro scale. Up until now, the ability to see Parkinson's in the brain was only possible post-mortem. After a person dies, something Professor Meza calls undesirable research. This is terrible in terms of uh, research, in terms of therapy. Um, we treat patients according to their symptoms, but not according to what actually happened to their tissue. We try to develop drugs without actually be able to see what's going on in the brain. What we're doing is doing it in, in vivo, so in a live subject and could be healthy or patient. Every Parkinson patient has a different set of symptoms, with it different effects on the brain. Can this really be detected? Well that's what Professor Meza is working on right now. The bigger question is what next? What will be done with this knowledge? The beauty of software for MRI is that it's actually easy to adopt and we really hope it will, will be adopted by the community. In a few years, that might be a tool that be used in hospitals or by drug companies when they try to test their drugs. The hope, after all, is better diagnosis and offering a new window to the workings of the human brain.